Morning, everyone. Morning. Whoa. Whoa. Good to see everyone today. A lot of happy faces. A lot. Before we begin, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this time. We dedicate these moments to you. We ask that your Holy Spirit will speak to each and every one of us, Lord. Whether it be the whole sermon or just a tidbit, we ask that it will be you, ultimately, who will be speaking and guiding all of us. And all these things, may you be known, may you be praised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we begin, we have my volunteers come. First one. Through Jesus Christ. 
what we see here, the Ephesians, is starting to build. It's starting to build all of this tension. And now we must ask the question, okay, now that we know all these things, now that we know the new humanity in Christ, now that we know we are sons and daughters, now that we know we have grace through faith in Christ, now that we know the mystery and the will of God, what does all of that mean? What does all of that have to do with our life? You see, brothers and sisters, if we do not know that this is our true status and position before God, how do we know how to live? If we do not know that we are children of God, if we do not know that we are a new humanity in Christ, how do we know how to live this life? But we see here, as we further, as we go further into Ephesians, now, Apostle Paul is going to show all of us, this is what it means to truly live your life in Christ. Now that the foundation has been laid, now you can start building upon that foundation. So please begin with me here in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And I will begin in verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you all to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Walk in this manner with all humility, gentleness, with patience, and bearing with one another in love, being eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Notice here, the Apostle Paul is telling all of us, he says that he's urging us to live a call worthy, to live in a worthy manner of the call that we've been given, the gift that we've been given. given. Notice that Paul is saying, I urge you, meaning he is strongly encouraging, strongly recommending that all of us, now that we know our true position in Jesus Christ, if we say we truly follow him, now that we know all these things, Paul is saying, I urge you, live in a way that reflects it. In other words, Apostle Paul is calling us up. Apostle Paul is saying, hey, young men and young women, brothers and sisters of all backgrounds and ages, step up. Now that you know your true inheritance, your true status, your true position in Jesus Christ, you need to step up and express this true position, express this true life in Christ. No longer should it just be head knowledge. No longer should it just be something abstract. But now it ought to be your life. I want to highlight this, that Apostle Paul here is calling us up. He's not calling us out. Now earlier, we saw three young men, high ambitions in their life. And as they walked through this life, they wanted to play basketball. And as we saw, when they played basketball, they broke the rules of basketball. And when you break the rules of basketball, you can't be a good basketball player. We saw the first young man, he uh, did his double dribble. And secondly, did the travel, and lastly, did the up-down. Now, these are all violations of the rules of basketball. And me, as the ref, I called them out. I blew my whistle and I said, no, nope, that's wrong, that's your fault. Start over. Now, I understand not many of us may be familiar with basketball. However, the principle is the same. In that whatever we do in life, whether it be going to school or other activities or sports, whatever groups you're involved with, many times it feels, it feels like that is what's happening to us all the time. People are constantly calling us out, whether it's our coaches, our teachers, our parents, our friends, everyone is constantly pointing your flaws. Everyone's constantly blowing the whistle and they say, hey, you did this wrong, do it again. Or hey, you did this wrong, just give up, don't even try anymore. It's embarrassing. No matter what it is, people are always calling us out all the time. From the small things to the big things. They're calling us out every 
single time. But this is not what Apostle Paul is doing. Now that Apostle Paul has showed us our true status and nature in Christ, he is saying, I'm not calling you guys out. I'm not saying, hey, your prayer was too short. Hey, your Bible reading was too short. Hey, you didn't even go to church. You're a bad Christian. You don't know God. Apostle Paul is not saying that. He's not calling you out. He's not calling any one of us out. He's not pointing our failures and our shortcomings. Instead, Apostle Paul is calling us up. Calling us up. Justin, may I have your cooperation? All right, man, I know today was the big game. I know there's a lot of people here. I know you're very nervous, okay? But don't worry about it. I saw you made small mistakes out there. But hey, it's okay. I got you, all right? Don't worry. These small mistakes, as your coach speaking, these small mistakes, I'm not going to hold it against you, all right? Because I saw, Justin, I saw with my own eyes in practice how good you were, how skilled you were, how great characteristics you had on the court, all right? And I know that today you might just be nervous, you might have the jitters, don't worry about it, all right? Because I believe and I know that you already have what it takes to be a great basketball player. All you got to do is embrace it. All you got to do is own it. All right, go get him. Go, go, go. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the calling up. But to further the point, and parents specifically, Many times when you see your teen hanging out with their friends or doing their activities, whoever they're with, sometimes you see that they might act a little bit different around you and around their friends. Now this different can be good or bad. And many times when it is the bad, I can't even imagine how many of the parents may feel heartbroken at that behavior and attitude in the words that their child is spewing. But parents, I want you to know that this is an opportunity for you to call up your child. What that means is that you can have that truly one-on-one -on -one time with them in conversation, in dialogue, but most importantly, emphasizing that, hey, son or daughter, I know who you are. I've raised you. I've seen since when you were an infant until now. I know your character. I know your true nature. And the way that you've been acting, the way that you've been speaking with your friends, I know that's not you. I know who you truly are, my son, my daughter. And this is me asking you to please embrace that. Embrace who you really are. Don't forsake it, but truly live into it, embody it, manifest your true nature, your true character. You already have these characteristics in you. All you need to do is exercise it. Brothers and sisters, we see here, again, I can't emphasize this enough, Apostle Paul is calling us up, calling us up, which means that everything Everything, this whole Christian life, this whole relationship with God, everything has already been provided in Jesus Christ. You and I don't have to work for it. You and I don't have to be scared about God calling us out, about pointing out every single sin in our life. We don't need to be afraid of that anymore. Because if and when we truly place our faith in Jesus Christ, He gives us everything we ever need to have a relationship with God. There is nothing you or I could bring to the table that will ever solidify that relationship anymore than what Christ has already done. All we need to do is embrace that inheritance. Embrace that status. All we need to do is exercise all of those rights and privileges that Jesus Christ himself has already secured for us. Meaning, you are already 
a son or daughter of God. There's no more need to search for who you are. Meaning, we are already have forgiveness. There's no more holding grudges against yourself or against other people. Meaning, you already have the presence of God, the Holy Spirit with you. If you are a true believer in Jesus Christ and follow and obey Him, God is already with you. There is no longer seeking where God is. There is an only calming your heart and to listen. But God is already here with you. And brothers and sisters, all of us must continue, continue to be caught up, continue to be challenged to live this life where everything has already been given to us. All we need to do is obey. All we need to do is step out in faith and listen to what God has already given us in Christ. So we see here that Apostle Paul is calling us up over and over again. And many times we listen to these lies and we forget that we are son and daughter of God. We forget we are forgiven. We forget that God is not calling us out. God is not putting a microscope on your flaws, on your mistakes. But God is simply saying, just come and just be with me. Let's walk in this life together. That's it. No more is God putting you on a pedestal and critiquing you. No more is anybody going to call you out for your mistakes. Because we know that in Christ, all of these mistakes have been forgiven. Not only that, but in Christ, we have been given such a greater status and inheritance and privileges. All we need to do is exercise those rights and privileges. But now that we know more and more, again and again, that we have all of these from chapter 1 to chapter 3 of Ephesians, all of the benefits of following Christ, and now Paul is calling us up to live into that, to embrace it, to show other people what that means. We also need to know that when we do that, we are not alone. It is not just me trying to be caught up, trying to live this life in Christ alone. It's not a solo mission. But God has given us this great gift that we now call the church. Continue with me here in verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, the church, until we all, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature humanity, and to the measure of the fullness of Christ. God has given us the church. That we all are living together as caught up children of God. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I see people who say they're Christian, and whenever I see them in church, I already expect that they have consented to being caught up. That they have consented to have these accountable relationships of other brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the whole point of church. That we're all here together to have that level of accountability. And a continual encouragement to be caught up, to not listen to the lies of the world, but to be caught up to our true status in Christ. Now I know for myself and many leaders, as verse 11 says, we are here to build up the church, build up all the saints or all the believers to do ministry. For what purpose? For this purpose. Verse 14. So that we may no longer be children who are tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, craftiness, and deceitful schemes. In other words, that is our cry, that is our anthem, anthem for TG. As you know, many teens who were there a couple weeks ago when we presented what TG will be all about this school year, it is exactly that. To combat 
the worldly, the secular, the godless teachings that has poisoned, that has infected so many of our lives and our minds today in so many ways that we don't even recognize it anymore. These is issues are such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transsexual, gender fluidity, alcohol, drugs, pornography, pride, politics, emotions, suicide, depression, everything. All the world is already teaching about these things and we must ask the question, where is God in all of these things? And I would say one place to start is here, in the church. This is where God is. And this is a shameless plug, inviting everyone, parents and teen alike, to please, although we don't have time to, to explain too much of what it means to combat the worldly doctrines, but this is exactly why we've devoted teen, teens group to this. So I invite you, yet again, please come to Teens Group, that we may all be better equipped to fight back in this world. Stop letting the world run us over as Christians. To stop letting the world tell us what to believe, but to actually know what we believe, because this is what God has created since the beginning of time. But it is, we are here as Christians, as believers, to challenge, to build each other up to that extent, to continue to combat the world and their ideas and the secular. But not only that, this passage also reveals something important for all of us, that we as believers, all of us together, when we are called up to embrace our true status, to live into our true nature as children of God, we do that together. But for what purpose? As many people have questioned already, why do I need to go to church? I can listen to a sermon online. I can sing songs online. I don't need to go to church. Why do I need to go to church? Why does it matter? And it's a good question. And I can think as myself, as I've reflected over the years, I think there has been two prominent lies about how I perceived church. And the first was this. I believed that church was a place for self-help. I believed that church was a place for self-help. I've distorted what church really was, and I've turned it into something I wanted it to be. And something, quite frankly, many Christians have turned it to be. The church, all a church really is, is just a seminar every week about me telling you how to feel better about yourself, about me telling you how to feel better about your life, about me telling you how to, how to solve your problems, how to solve stress, how to solve this in your life. That's a lie. If that was what church is about, the world is already doing a way better job at that than the church. Thank God, that is not what the church is about. I've also believed the church was simply just a book club. All we do is come here, sit around, you know, read this book called the Bible, and we just share what, uh, you know, what cool thing we learned and how it made us feel. The all church was is a book club, a self-help seminar in a book club. If church is truly a self-help seminar in a book club, then yes. I don't need to go to church because I can find all of that somewhere else and in a better version. But I think one of the most, one of the biggest lie I grew up with as well, believing and thinking what church was, is exactly this. Here we see in verse 13 it says, that the leader, leaders will continue to build the church, equip the church until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Unity of the faith, meaning Christ, Jesus Christ is the only reason why we are here. 
It's not about self-help. It's not about book club. But you see, I've grown up not just thinking about these two things, but something even more deeper than that. I grew up thinking that church was a cultural center. Now, I know many of you already go to Chinese school, but think about church on a Chinese school on steroids, all right? That was how I perceived church. Granted, I'm not Chinese. However, there are many, many overlappings area, such as this. I go to church. Great, we talk about God. We care about God. Nice. I feel better about myself. All right, now let's go hang out. Let's go talk about real problems and real issues in our lives. Let's talk about what are the problems facing us, Chinese Americans, Asian Americans as a whole, within the education system, within the society. What are these issues? And that these gatherings at church started to become more so as a place for me to feel better being Asian American in this country. That for one time, for one day of the week, I don't have to feel like a minority. I grew up in a largely Caucasian, African American, Hispanic population. There was barely any Asians. You can just imagine the type of training this has done to my mind. That I started to idolize the gathering of people who look like me talk like me, I think like me. Because even when I went to African American churches, Hispanic churches, other Asian churches, or, or white American churches, I still felt disconnected. I still felt isolated. Even though they were worshiping the same God, there was still that wall. It was only when I was with people who look like me, talk like me, think like me, that I felt more alive more involved in the community. You see, brothers and sisters, many times we come to church not because of Christ. It could be because of self-help to solve your own problems so that you can maintain your comfort, you can maintain your privileges, you can maintain a life that has no problems. Or we can come to church thinking it's a book club, thinking that, oh, I just read this book to see how it makes me feel and how it entertains my mind. It helps me escape reality just for a moment. Or, like myself, we can all come to church thinking that it's just a cultural center for me to remember what does it mean to be Chinese American. Oh yeah, I go to church. That, they were remind me of that. No. Brothers and sisters, we see here that when we are called up to live as believers together in our true nature, true status, true position in Jesus Christ, we live that together as the church for this purpose, to have the unity of the faith. To truly come here together because of Jesus Christ. And that's it. Only because of Jesus Christ. You can just imagine, I know so many of you teens and parents have witnessed this. There's so many human gatherings today. Just think about it. How, how big are these football stadiums? How many people gather in the name of football? Think about that. How many people gather at all these concerts in the name of these musicians and these artists? Think about that. And here, we must ask ourselves the same question. Are we here to gather because of Christ or because of something else? Because if it is something else, we are not following God. We're following something else. So that is why we are here as the church, to live up, to be caught up as sons and daughters of God together. That can only happen when Jesus is the center. That can only happen when Jesus is the reason why we are here. But not only that, take it a step further. Apostle Paul adds to that in verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Until we are mature. The knowledge of the Son of God. This knowledge that Paul speaks of is not just a mental knowledge. It's not just a thinking hard about life knowledge. It is an experience. It is a type of knowledge you can only gain from experience. 
And I've mentioned this before in the past, but we as believers, being caught up to live together as the church, we can all be here. When we are all here together, I believe, we all have a given consent to preach the gospel to one another. And I'm not just talking about with your words. I'm talking about with your life. Show me forgiveness. Treat me like a brother in Christ. Show me there is a new humanity. Don't just talk about it. We are here as a church to do exactly just that. Show each other the gospel. Don't just talk about the gospel. And we can begin to do that here. And the rest of chapter 4 talks about how do we do that. But I'm just going to focus on one thing. I'm just going to focus on one way for all of us to be caught up, to live together in the true status and nature in Christ together. How do we gather together under Christ and how do we preach the gospel to each other with our lives? This is how. But to be clear, this is not a training session to be a good person. This is not a training session to save the dolphins. This is not a training session to save the trees. This is not a training session to go help an elderly woman cross the street. No. That's moralism. We are not here in the church to learn to be nice people. We are not here in the church to learn to be good citizens of the USA. No. We are here to truly be sons and daughters of God on this sin-infected world. Everything we do is an expression of faith. Earlier, I mentioned about Bible reading, praying, and going to church. These three things are great, but they are not, I repeat, they are not what it means to be a Christian. Just because you go to church, just because you pray, just because you read the Bible does not make you a Christian. These three things, church, Bible, praying, are expressions of our faith. Again, going to church, Bible reading, and praying are expressions of our faith. They are not the essence, they are not the foundation of our faith. Ephesians chapter 1 through 3 again shows us what does it mean to be a Christian? Place your faith in Jesus Christ, receive his benefits, live and obey. Everything else is an expression of being a Christian. And so we see that this part that I'm going to highlight now is an expression of being a Christian. So go down with me here, verse 25. This is one way we can preach the gospel to each other. This is one way we can live the new life and status in humanity together as the church. Verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Verse 29. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only what is good for building up. And lastly, verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and slander be put away from you, along with malice. These three verses, it's not an accident. These three verses highlight and have one thing in common. Speech. How do you speak? What is the language you use? And again and again, I will continue to emphasize this. This is not about learning to talk nicely to people. But that even the way we talk is an expression of our faith. Even the way that we talk to each other, talk to ourselves, is the exercising of our faith. It's not just to learn to talk nicely to people. No. It is to learn to use our speech as a spiritual exercise as an act of worship to God. Now, first and foremost, one thing that I have been seeing lately 
is that we all like to, I know you can't see it, but flex. Many, many of us love to flex. We love to flex, flex, flex. Now, for many parents who don't understand this idea of flexing, it is basically this. It is a form of speech where you pick your strongest characteristic, your own personal strong characteristic or possession or skill. You take that from your life and you hold it out for everyone else to be jealous over, to gawk over, to idolize, to want. For example, if I was really good at a certain instrument, that is what I would be bragging on. I'd be like, oh, oh, it's, it's nothing, it's nothing. While everyone is like, oh, you know, jaws dropping and everything, all the judges give me 10 or 9.9, .9, right? And I'm saying, oh, it's nothing, it's nothing. But in actuality, it is me flexing. It is me trying to show that, hey, because I can play this instrument so well, because I can play this sports so well, because I can do so well in school, I'm special. I'm set apart. It makes me more significant than you. It makes me more important than you. And that is why when I talk about these things, I try to be humble, but actually I'm not. It is me flexing. It is me trying to put it in your face. Hey, I'm better at this than you. I'm better as a person than you. Therefore, I am feeding off of your feeling of insignificance. This type of speech is pervasive. We do it without thinking. We've been so trained to do it without thinking. We do it in our sleep. We do it on command. We do it in a, you know, in a battle against someone else. But you see, brothers and sisters, this type of speech is not good for building one another up. We must ask the question, why do people flex to begin with? It's a good question, right? Why do people brag? Why do people boast? Especially on themselves. Why do they do that? Is it because they truly feel that apart from what they do, that they are no more important than anyone else? Is it truly because they feel that the only way for them to feel important, to feel significant, is if they choose that one thing in their life to show people so that they can be set apart from everyone else? In other words, they're trying to gain significance and value and worth in themselves. This is why people flex. They're saying, hey, look at me. I'm so great. You should desire to be like me. Because I have it all. But brothers and sisters, there is no more need to flex. Flexing is no more. We are no longer bounded and chained by flexing. Because guess what? Our value and our worth is only found in Jesus Christ. When we are caught up, when we are living obediently to Christ, to, with Christ together, we know that our true value and significance and worth has already been finished and accomplished in Jesus. Ephesians 2.10, what does it say? You are a masterpiece. And God has created every single one of us to be a masterpiece. When we follow Christ, we are created new to a masterpiece only God can make. There is no longer any need to brag on myself to feel important. But not only that, it's also this. Not only do we flex and brag on ourselves, but we also do, of course, the famous roasting. So mom and dad, in case you don't know, roasting is a type of speech where you take the flaw, the mistakes of a person, you take that one little thing, and you put it under a microscope, and you amplify it, and you see all of the, all of the messed up things in that little flaw. 
And then you go to that person and you start to disrespect them with that, with that flaw that they have. For example, just an example, all right? <laughs> so let's just say that uh, one of the teens made a mistake this one day. For example, let's just say they, on accident, walked into, let's just say for me, I'm a guy, right? So on accident, I walk into the ladies' bathroom. This one day, okay, I didn't know until I came out, and then some people saw. But this mistake will follow me for the rest of my life. Wherever I go, whenever I go use the bathroom, I can see Justin and Hudson saying, oh, I don't go to the girls' bathroom, right? Or, oh, wrong bathroom, right? Because they're, they're using that to constantly, what they call, roast me. They're using that one mistake, that one flaw in my life. They're amplifying it under a microscope, and they're saying, ha-ha, because you made this mistake, now I, the person who's roasting you, can feel better about myself. Because I'm not as foolish as Fong. I don't walk into the girl's bathroom. I'm not as foolish as him. Therefore, ha, huh, I'm great. And so you can, you can replace this with any, any other type of mistake you want. But the point still stands the same. The point is this. That in our society, that is how we talk to one another. We boast on ourselves, and we put other people down for their mistakes. We call them out, as we said earlier. Constantly blowing the whistle, just waiting for someone to make a mistake so we can blow our whistle and call them out. But you see, brothers and sisters, no longer do we need to flex, do we need to roast. Because we know that all of our flaws, all of our sins have been forgiven. We know that our value, our worth only comes from God, not from us. And as true believers who follow Christ, as be people who are caught up to take the challenge, to embrace your true nature, your true status under Christ, we don't need to speak in these matters anymore. That these types of talking were created by the world to try to make up for what the world is lacking for value, significance, for forgiveness of sins. But we as believers no longer need to do that. And this, our speech is, truly it is, an act, an expression of our faith. And this is just one direct way that we can start living up, being caught up as sons and daughters of God now because everything has already been completed in Christ. All we need to do is animate it. All we need to do is exercise it. All we need to do is live it and show people who God is. Starting with our speech. Because our speech is the number one indicator of what is on our hearts. You can know what is on someone's heart based off of how they talk or don't talk. And when we listen very closely in the roastings and in the flexing and in the passive aggression, we hear a lot of brokenness. We hear a lot of pain. We hear a lot of feelings of insignificance. We hear a lot of desperation, of trying to know who they are, of trying to feel some level of importance. But as the Bible says here, if you truly follow Christ, you are already a son and daughter of God. You already have treasures in heaven. You already have God's presence, the Holy Spirit with you. You are a new person, a new creation, a masterpiece. There is no more wandering off. There is no more searching. There is no more trying to find yourself in this world. Because you are already found. What we must do first is surrender. And listen and obey our Lord. Then and only then can we truly live a new humanity. Then and only then can we live being sons and daughters of God as the church, united under Christ, 
preaching the gospel to one another. Only when we know our true nature and status in Christ can we do that. But if you don't actually believe that, if you still believe the lies, it's going to be very difficult to live as sons and daughters of God. But this is why we come together as the church. Even if you can't fight these lies, I will fight it for you. I will tell you that no, you are not insignificant. You are loved. You are more treasured than you can possibly imagine. And this is why coming, joining together as the church is so important. We are not meant to fight our own battles. We are meant to fight for each other. I got your back, you got my back. In the battles that I can't fight, you will be my reinforcement. When you can't fight, I will be your reinforcement. There is no, no longer solo missions. We are all in this together as the church, as sons and daughters of God, as the bride of Christ. Let us continue to fight for that and push for that in every aspect of our life, beginning with our speech. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for speaking to us and into your word. Lord, we ask that you, Holy Spirit, will continue to solidify in all of these brothers and sisters' lives that they are already valuable. They have already been bought. They have already been a new creation because of you, Jesus. If they truly follow you, if they truly place their faith and their trust in you, Jesus, then they have all of these inheritance already. All of these status and rights and privileges that they can exercise any single day, all day, every day. Holy Spirit, may you lead us as the church to continue to challenge one another to live faithfully, obediently to you, together, God, not by ourselves, but together. Holy Spirit, I ask that you will help many of these men and women reflect on their speech, Lord. I know we all like to roast. I know we all like to flex. And I know we all like to be passive, aggressive. So, Lord, I ask that you will rebuke us. I ask that you will show us, Lord, that if we are talking this way, what is in our heart? If this is how we speak to one another, then our hearts must be very dark indeed. So, Holy Spirit, we ask that you rebuke us. We ask that you cleanse us. We ask that you convict us. We ask that you humble us. We ask that you discipline us and show us what does it mean to truly follow you, to truly animate, to truly live out, live in, and be caught up to our true status and nature in Christ. That we don't need to struggle anymore. We don't need to feel so lost anymore, God. Because if we truly follow you, everything has been provided Everything has been given to us in Christ. We participate in Jesus Christ's inheritance and in his life and death. In all this, Lord, we thank you. May you continue to lead us and prepare our hearts for the week. And we will not forget what has been said today. We will not forget who you are. We will not forget that if we truly follow you, if we truly trust you and obey you, you are with us in everything. In all this we surrender. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.